clean energy investments in other countries like Italy, Mexico, and Argentina are rapidly increasing their investments. The United States, on the other hand, is falling behind. If we are not willing to make long-term investments, we risk limiting our competitiveness in the years to come, something we simply cannot afford to do. So I want to thank the witnesses for being here today. I look forward to your testimony. And I want to, as we look at this particular problem, I want to know how it is that, you know, are we looking at one situation here or are we uh, doing a blanket uh, indictment of all the, uh, the, our efforts in this regard? Because I think we can, if, 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 if we are going to paint with one brush uh, this entire effort, I think that would be a, ma a major mistake. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. Does anyone else wish to make an opening statement? All right. With that, we will uh, we'll introduce our panel. We first have with us uh, Mr. Gregory Friedman, who is the Inspector General at the United States Department of Energy. We want to thank uh, Honorable Friedman for being here today. Mr. Elliot Lewis is the Assistant Inspector General for Audit at the U.S. Department of Labor. We also have with us Dr. David Montgomery, Senior Vice President of the National Economic Research Associates, Incorporated, and is formerly Assistant Director of the CBO, as well as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Policy at the U.S. Department of Energy. As I indicated earlier, Mr. Katz is on his way. And we also have with us uh, Mr. Brett McMahon, who is President of Miller & Long, D.C., and we appreciate um, our panel being here. We are going to go ahead and swear you guys in. When Mr. Katz gets here, we will we'll, we'll do that. This is the, the uh, rules of the committee. So if you will just please stand up, raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? If you do so, just answer in the affirmative. Let the record show that everyone answered in the affirmative. Um, we, you guys know the rules, five minutes, you know, and you get the, the, the light system there. So stick to that as best you can, and we will we'll start right down the road here with uh, uh, Mr. Friedman. You are recognized for your five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, I appreciate the opportunity to, to testify today at your request on the work of the Office of Inspector General concerning the Department of Energy's implementation of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009. The intent of the Recovery Act was to quickly stimulate the economy and create jobs while fostering an unprecedented level of accountability and transparency. The Department received $35.2 billion in Recovery Act funding dramatically increasing the budgets traditionally available for initiatives such as home weatherization, environmental cleanup, science projects, and loan guarantees to advance energy technologies. With the passage of the Recovery Act, the Office of Inspector General immediately launched efforts to assist the Department. We have issued 68 reports covering all major Recovery Act initiatives and activities, initiated over 100 Recovery Act-related criminal investigations, and conducted 300 fraud awareness briefings around the country for nearly 16,000 Federal contractors, State, local, and other officials. Based on our body of work, we found the efforts by the Department to use Recovery Act funds to stimulate the economy was more challenging than many had originally envisioned. Our reviews identified a fairly consistent pattern of delays in the pace at which Recovery Act funds have been expended by grant and other financial assistance recipients. As of October 22, 2011, according to the Department's own records, recipient organizations had spent only 55 percent of available Recovery Act funds. In terms of the Department's ability to meet the Recovery Act goals, we found that weatherization work, for example, was often of questionable quality. In one recent State-level report, we found that nine of the 17 homes visited failed inspections because of substandard workmanship. The success of the weatherization program was affected by other management issues as well. For example, one major subrecipient gave preferential treatment to its own employees and their relatives for weatherization services over other eligible residents who were elderly or who had special needs. The loan guarantee program could not always readily do demonstrate through documentation how it resolved or mitigated relevant risks prior to granting loan guarantees, and one of the Department's environmental management sites, relying on Recovery Act funded, adopted an approach to radioactive waste processing that could have cost about $25 million more than necessary. Further, the Office of Inspector General is investigating various Recovery Act related schemes, including the submission of false information, mischarging, and misrepresenting test results. To date, these investigations have resulted in over $2.3 million in monetary recoveries 
as well as a number of criminal prosecutions. This includes a series of cases involving fictitious claims for travel per diem resulting in the recovery of $1 million alone in Recovery Act funds. The Recovery Act established extremely challenging goals for the Department. Notwithstanding the Department's intense effort to meet these goals, we had a number of overarching observations about the Recovery Act's implementation. These included, first, the demanding nature of the Recovery Act's implementation placed an enormous strain on the Department's then existing infrastructure. Second, dealing with a diverse and complex set of departmental stakeholders complicated the Recovery Act startup, administration, and execution. Third, although shovel-ready projects were the symbolic goal of the Recovery Act, in most cases execution was more challenging and time-consuming than had been anticipated. Fourth, infrastructure at the State and local levels was overwhelmed. Ironically, in several States, those charged with implementing the Recovery Act's provisions had been furloughed due to economic conditions in those States. Fifth, the pace of actual expenditures was significantly slowed because of the time needed to understand and to address specific requirements of the Recovery Act. And finally, recipients of Recovery Act funding expressed their frustration with what they described as overly complex and burdensome reporting requirements. In summary, a combination of massive funding, high expectations, and inadequate infrastructure resulted at times in less than optimal performance. Over the next year, we will further review Recovery Act expenditures in a number of high-risk areas, and our investigative efforts continue. Additionally, we are evaluating how the Department plans to deal with the loss of over 4,000 environmental management jobs by the end of this year, a significant downsizing of the workforce that was dedicated to Recovery Act funded work. Further, we are refining our observations on the Department's implementation of the Recovery Act and are drafting a report to highlight other lessons learned from this experience. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my statement, and I would be pleased to answer any questions that you or the subcommittee may have. I thank the gentleman for his testimony. Mr. Lewis, you are now recognized. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me to testify today on the OIG's recent report regarding the Department's Green Jobs Program. As part of our oversight responsibilities and in response to a congressional request, we conducted this audit to determine how the Employment and Training Administration had defined green jobs, how they used the $500 million in funds provided by the Recovery Act, and what the grantees had reported achieving with respect to training and placement of workers, including employment retention. The OIG's findings and recommendations are based on the latest data reported by the grantees to ETA as of June 30, 2011. We found that ETA defined green jobs as jobs associated with products and services that use renewable energy sources, reduce pollution, and conserve natural resources. ETA derived this definition from the Green Jobs Act, the Energy Policy Act, and from its own database of occupational requirements and worker attributes. The Recovery Act mandated that the funds be used for projects that prepare workers for careers in energy efficiency and renewable energy, as described in the Workforce Investment Act. Therefore, we determined that the definition of green jobs used by ETA to award grants was in compliance with the requirements of the Recovery Act. The second objective of our audit was to determine how the funds had been used. We found that of the $500 million provided, ETA awarded the majority of the funding, or $435 million, for training programs to prepare workers, help targeted populations overcome barriers to employment, help participants obtain industry-recognized credentials, and place them into green jobs. Overall, our audit found that although ETA obligated all of the $490 million in grants as of June 30, 2011, grantees had reported expenditures of $163 million, or 33 percent of the amount awarded while approximately 73 percent of the training and non-training -grant, non grant periods had already elapsed. Our audit also evaluated what grantees had reported achieving with respect to training and placement of workers, including employment retention. We found that with 61 percent of training grant periods having elapsed, grantees have reported achieving limited performance targeting, targets for serving and placing workers. Grantees reported that 53,000 individuals were served, 42 percent of the targeted 125,000. 47,000 participants enrolled in training, about 40 percent of the targeted 115,000. 26,000 participants completed training, 27 percent of the targeted 97,000. 
and 8,000 participants were placed into employment, 10, 10 percent of the program's goal of 80,000. And finally, 1,300 participants retained employment for more than six months, about 2 percent of the plan, 70,000. It is important to emphasize that these training programs are still underway, and we would expect to see changes in the reported results by the time the programs are completed. In response to our audit, ETA officials stated that they expected performance to significantly increase over time due to an initial lag during the startup phase of the grants. However, ETA could not demonstrate that grantees were on target to meet planned outcomes, nor was there a plan to, a plan to ensure that they could. In addition, according to interviews we conducted with ETA regional officials early this year, grantees had expressed concerns about the overall poor economic conditions and their green jobs had not materialized and therefore job placements had been much less than expected. As a result, we are concerned as to whether grantees will effectively use the funds and deliver targeted employment outcomes by the end of their grants. Accordingly, we recommended that ETA evaluate the Green Jobs Program and, in so doing, obtain a current estimate of funds each grantee will realistically spend given the current job market and the demand for green job-related skills. This will help the Department identify and correct any de performance de issues before the grants expire and assess whether the grant funds will remain unspent and could, therefore, be recouped and returned to the U.S. Treasury so they can be available for other purposes. In response to our recommendations, ETA stated, that it has put in place appropriate measures to monitor progress and provide technical assistance to help ensure ultimate grant success for those grantees that may be at risk of not delivering all of their outcomes. ETA further stated that it has obligated all of its Recovery Act funds and that it expects all funds will have been expended by September 30, 2013, as required by the Office of Management Budget. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, based on the results of our audit, we believe the Department has an opportunity to evaluate the performance of the Green Job Program while it is underway in order to correct any performance issues and maximize outcomes. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to, to testify on our work, and I would be pleased to answer any questions that you or any members of the subcommittee may. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Dr. Montgomery, you are now recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I think I can summarize my testimony in five points. Um, first is that the project failures and wasted money that we are discussing today are not isolated examples of improper execution of an otherwise worthwhile and potentially successful program. The entire concept of using stimulus funds to create a green economy through energy spending is misguided. Um, second point. I would make to develop that is that green energy has none of the characteristics that are required to make effective use of stimulus funding. In countering a recession, the objective is to expend funds as quickly as possible, and Mr. Friedman has pointed out that that hasn't been happening, uh, and also to phase out that spending as the economy improves. This kind of stimulus objective is simply inconsistent with the Department of Energy's mission. Applying this public works approach to energy would repeat the cycle of boom and bust that has contributed to the failure of most of our past efforts to deploy and to develop and deploy new energy technology. Um, so my third point would be that the Recovery Act funds have also been applied at the wrong end of the research, development, and deployment spectrum, whereas there is the least economic rationale for government involvement and the highest likelihood of waste and failure. I point out in my written testimony the great disproportion that existed in the Department of Energy even before the stimulus funds compared to other research organizations in terms of how much money goes into basic research and how much goes into funding for large-scale demonstration projects. The stimulus program made that far, far worse. Now, the reason that economists give for a government role in R&D is the inability of private researchers to appropriate the full value of their research. This is a serious problem across the board in basic and in some applied research, um, but it is only a problem at the de deployment and commercialization stage if there is no market for their product. Um, the second point is that peer review makes it possible for government research organizations to do a good job of allocating funds to basic research, but government has proven over and over again that it cannot consistently pick winners in the application of known technology. Um, and finally, there is a reason why so much money goes into this deployment uh, and technology demonstration and why it fails. These are the projects that have electoral significance. They attract lobbying, rent-seeking, and pork-barrel politics, and therefore become to be chosen independent of either their economic or technical merit. Um, 
My fourth point would be that the kinds of upfront funding reprided by the Recovery Act basically create hothouse plants. And I think this has a lot to do with what we saw in Solyndra and with other bankruptcies that we are seeing today. Some, some, uh, pro some, some of these hothouse plants will survive. My wife is occasionally lucky, but it is the exception. And again, there is a reason for the failures. Upfront funding is not a universal substitute for the lack of a market. Green is not enough. Green technology that produces energy that costs more than its current fossil or nuclear substitutes is not going to be purchased, and consumers are not going to be willing to pay enough to cover the cost of ongoing business for many of the projects that are being funded under, under the Recovery Act. The Recovery Act, therefore, has turned into a backdoor and ineffective substitute for what Congress has decided it does not want, a price on carbon. If there is no price on carbon, there is going to be not much of a market for green technology, and these projects will fail. In other words, if it is not a good idea to put a price on carbon, it is an even worse idea to loan money and fund projects that need it in order to survive. So that, I think, would be my final point, that in my opinion, it is very likely that most of the Recovery, projects, Recovery Act projects will fail in one of three senses. Some will fail to survive even with the subsidy that is provided in upfront funding and loans if the value of their product in the market isn't enough to cover the ongoing cost of producing it. And I think, to be fair, many of these projects were originally conceived with the hope that there would be a price on carbon, as Mr. Kucinich pointed out. Um, second, the Recovery Act funding will fail to jumpstart technologies or industries, because if every new venture has to have upfront, an upfront subsidy in order to overcome the capital barrier that exists because we don't put a price on carbon, I don't have a market demand for green technology, then things will end with the Recovery Act projects. And finally, it seems that the, to me that these projects will fail to provide a return to the taxpayer ever if the Recovery Act fails to if the Recovery Act is supporting projects that can't pass the cost benefits test on their own. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Montgomery. Mr. Cass, if you please rise, we just need to swear you in. You walked in just after we swore everyone else in. So if you just please stand up and stand, raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? If you do, just answer in the affirmative. Yes. All right. Thank you, Mr. Katz. Sorry about that. We uh, know you were caught in traffic and we uh, welcome you to the committee. And you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. Um, my background is in finance. I have an MBA from Stanford. I worked as the Director of Financing for Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy in the Department of Energy for the last 10 years. I have been involved in private equity financing for clean energy. I have been involved in funding uh, billions of dollars of clean energy projects, both at a project development and a venture capital perspective. Um, the way I look at that is, is from a finance perspective, and I can say that our international competitors, Japan, Germany and China are not sitting still. They are heavily subsidizing uh, this race to a clean energy future, which is a transition that uh, pretty much all companies, certainly the U.S. military and the large majority of governments now recognize we are involved in. So the support for AR funding and clean energy, although it has had a steep ramp up and had some teething problems on balance, was well timed and has been very important in supporting the U.S. ability to compete in this critical area. Um, a, Brookings, a recent Brookings study found that between 2003 and 2010, in this clean energy area, there has been an 8.3 percent job growth. It has been one of the most important areas of job growth domestically and uh, is an area that our competitors are investing in. So in terms of economic opportunity and job growth, it has been an important driver for the economy. The U.S. military is committed to clean energy because in its view and based on its actual uh, experience, clean energy allows them to deliver uh, their military purpose uh, and security more cost effectively than reliance on fossil fuels. So, the security dimension of clean energy has become much more important. Uh, the U.S. military has been very clear on this particular issue. Um, there was a <clears throat> uh, two, uh, several independent nonpartisan reviews about the impact of a ARRA funding on clean energy. The Council of Economic Advisers in uh, November of 2010 found that as of the third quarter of 2010, between 2.7 
and 3.7 million new jobs had been created from this AARA funding, and that it had a positive impact on GDP of 2.7 percent. In May 2011, U.S. Congressional Budget Office found that in the first quarter of 2011, the impact of this AAR funding had been an increase of between 1.1 and 3.1 percent GDP growth, and then increase in full-time employment of between 1.6 million and 4.6 million people. These success stories are being built on. As discussed, this very steep ramp-up in funding is hard to, was hard to deliver because the personnel were not there. As that funding gets deployed in the field, we expect to see uh, increase in economic productivity and an increase in employment. The last point I would make is that the uh, OMB, in its 1705 loan guarantee program, assumed and budgeted for a 12.8.5 percent default rate, an almost 13 percent default rate. Solyndra and, more recently, Beacon, uh, which went bankrupt, uh, represented about 1.6 percent of that total funding. We expect to receive back a portion, that is, recover a portion of that funding. So the total default rate to date, based on these two companies, it will be about 1 percent. That is less than one-tenth of the projected default rate expected for and planned for by OMB. About 90 percent of AAR funding goes to large clean uh, energy generation projects. The large U.S. companies like General and Electric, who are competing in international markets, have found this funding critical to their ability to compete and to expand and build on jobs. Funding for Johnson Controls, for example, in building a 3,000-person clean battery uh, bank, excuse me, uh, production facility in Michigan, um, will create 3,000 direct jobs and many more indirect jobs at a cost of under $100,000 per job. So it's not a perfect story, but given the rate of ramp up expected from this funding, the success story I think has been pretty clear. Million, at least a million to three million jobs created a lot of strengthening of U.S. competitiveness on this critical international issue. And for investors in, in clean technology, it is really a, a commitment to the future. It is really a vote for those who are optimistic about America's capacity to compete successfully in this critical market. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Katz. Uh, Mr. McMahon, you are recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairman Jordan, uh, uh, Ranking Member Kucinich, and uh, other members of the subcommittee. My name is uh, Brett McMahon. I am uh, president of the recently founded uh, Miller & Long, D.C., Inc. Uh, we are a Washington, D.C. based subcontractor. My previous employer, Miller & Long uh, Company, Inc., was founded in D.C. in 1947. It is one of the nation's oldest and largest subcontractors. The uh, company regularly employs approximately 1,500 people as form building carpenters, cement finishers, reinforcing rodmen, layout engineers, equipment operators, laborers, everything uh, that you could think of under the sun for our particular trade. We have uh, provided employment for over 75,000 D.C. area residents over the last 64 years. During my 19 years in construction, I've, I personally have overseen over 50 high-rise concrete structures and, and have been proud to provide employment for over seven th several thousand construction workers, both here in D.C. and in the Carolinas also active in a number of uh, organizations here locally, uh, including um, the D.C. Construction Trades Academy at C Cardoza Senior High School, where we provide the only uh, uh, vocational training available for construction workers in the District of Columbia. I first heard the term green-collar jobs about four years ago. Uh, like many, I was not sure what the term meant. Since so, and since so much of the focus seemed to center around my industry, I thought it would be wise to at least learn some more about it. I learned over time that the term was actually a lot more political than actual, being clear that it was just a new label on jobs that actually have existed for years. A lot of the public relations effort has gone into trying to claim there is something new here, and unfortunately, that is not the case. Considering this, uh, sir, please, the following example, because uh, I thought this was the clearest I have ever seen, uh, by a gentleman named uh, Mark Anderberg, Anderberg from the Texas Workforce Development Commission in a report labeled Green Collar Workers and Other Mythical Creatures. In it, if you have the testimony in front of you, you see a picture of two different toilets. One is a low-flow toilet, one is the old-fashioned one. And the question that begs from this is, what are the skill differences for installing these two things? What is the possible difference between installing this one and that one? And the question, is, the problem is, there isn't one. 
Uh, however, uh, the claim is that somehow they are trying to uh, say that there is a new job created because you can install the low flow toilet instead of the old one. For a non-construction example, I hope we could all agree that the skills necessary to drive an electric car are the same skills necessary to drive the largest SUV. The same driver can operate either vehicle just as the same plumber could install either toilet. The difference is in the product and not the operator. However, a great deal of effort and tax dollars have gone to the purpose of convincing the public that the plumber installs a low-flow toilet should now be called a green-collar plumber and that the new label should count as a new job. This kind of thing makes those of us in construction wonder where somebody would come up with that idea. But there is something important about the new label that I did not understand at first. If the new label is more than just a political talking point but is actually a formal new capital O occupation title per the U.S. Department of Labor, then a new problem is created. When a new occupation is designated for the construction industry, a new set of standards is developed. In addition to the antiquated and complex determination of a prevailing wage, a new apprenticeship training standard is established, even though, in this case, the only difference is in nomenclature, not in skill set. With that understanding, I will relate how this program unfolded in the District of Columbia. On October 4, 2007, I attended a meeting in the D.C. Department of Employment Services. The purpose of the meeting was to discuss the rollout of the Green Collar Jobs Initiative. The meeting was basically handled by the uh, staff from the Center for American Progress. The handout we received is attached to, to this uh, document. I kept it because it laid out the goals of their program very clearly, even included, for the first time I had ever received one from a, a, a D.C.-based meeting, a bar chart schedule de detailing new mandatory apprenticeships that would be required to work on any project covered by the then uh, brand new, at that time, D.C. Green Building Act. This proposal was a great concern to me because it took my company 26 years to get our apprenticeship program passed by the D.C. Apprenticeship Council. In fact, the only reason we were finally accepted was because the Apprenticeship Council uh, at that point had its first and only non-union member. Union control of apprenticeship boards is a common roadblock for the 87 percent of construction workers who have chosen the merit shop over unions. So when a new occupation get its, gets its own apprenticeship training standards, the participating employers, employers must apply to have their program accepted. Having spent the better part of three decades getting our current program accepted, we were not looking forward to going through the whole process again. In the district, there is a local hiring ordinance known as First Source, which includes mandatory registered apprenticeship participation. First Source only applies to those projects that receive a certain level of assistance from the district government. What is shown in this handout is that the advocates were planning to take the first source mandatory apprenticeship concept to a new level. The inset uh, here from the project schedule is taken from that handout. The advocates were planning to make new green collar apprenticeship mandates apply to every project covered by the new D.C. Green Building Act. Unfortunately, the D.C. The DC green Building Act actually covers every brick and stick, public or private, inside the city limits of Washington, D.C., and we were basically looking at being barred from working inside the district. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McMahon. We, we appreciate uh, everyone's uh, testimony. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Friedman, Mr. Lewis, based on, um, based on your testimony, it looks like both this weatherization program and the, and the green jobs training program are, by I guess anyone's conclusion, just a complete failure. Uh, and I want to start with you, uh, Mr. Lewis, and walk through this. Based on your testimony, if I, I think I got the numbers right, $490 million is out the door. Uh, but only $163 million has been spent. Is that, is that accurate? Correct. That, that was as of June 30th. Okay. And, and uh, how many, um, the $162.8, $163 million spent, how many people have been trained? Uh, completed training, uh, 26,000 people. And how many ha now have uh, a job that's that's uh, how many have been successful, been trained, and actually are working in this area and, and, and have a job that uh, for any length of time, let's say six months? Uh, of the twenty six thousand, about eight thousand people were placed into a job. And do you know the math on that? So we've spent one hundred sixty three million and, and trained uh, twenty some thousand. Only eight thousand have actually received a job. I mean, you know how much we're spending per per I person? Didn't. Uh... <laughs> I had not calculated several that. several thousand hurt. dollars probably right yes. maybe even close to I mean maybe approaching well it wouldn't be quite a hundred million but or a hundred thousand but lots of lots of money spent uh, spent per uh, per job uh, do you see any way in fact what what were the targets that the Department of Energy had had laid out 
uh, Department of Labor. The Department of Labor, I'm sorry. The, the, the total grants uh, added up to uh, a plan to, to uh, train uh, about 97,000 people. Uh, we're at 26,000 have been trained at this point. Okay. I do believe at the end of June there were around 20,000 people that were in the program. All right. And do we know about do we know anything about these the folks in this program? Have they been laid off? Are they on unemployment? I mean, what 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 do we know about the people in the program? Do we know? Uh, some of the some of the people in the program were unemployed, although there were uh, some of the grants were also designed to target incumbent workers, so workers who were already employed but wanted to upgrade their skills to qualify for a green job or to maintain a job. Okay. And so there, I guess there's two perspectives to look at. You got several thousand people who have been trained. Some of them may have been receiving some kind of benefit from the taxpayer. Now the taxpayer is helping them get trained, so there's, they could be receiving unemployment and getting this, these additional dollars spent. Uh, most of them are not getting a job. So we, we got the harm to the taxpayer, but frankly also the harm to the individual who went through this training and has maybe not a whole lot to show for it. Uh, if, if we have trained them in something that there is not a job for, then, yes, we are not doing them the best benefit. Did you think there is any way we can recover, you said $490 uh, million out the door, but only 163 spent. Is there any way we can recover the additional, the, the over, you know, 200 and some uh, million dollars? Well, of course, those numbers were as of June. So as this quarter, million, which excuse. we don't have the reports in yet, uh, there would be more funding spent. I don't know how much. But uh, isn't there at some point when you say this program is not working, this actually reminds me of an, another program we have had hearings on, the HAMP program, which was designed to help 4 million homeowners stay in their homes and helped a few thousand, um, lots of money out the door, but lots of money hasn't. So is there, is there any way you think we can get the money back, not do any more harm to people, put them in training that is not going to benefit them, and actually get the money back for, for the taxpayer? Uh, yeah, and that is what we have asked the Department to do, to look at you know how much at this point has not been spent, and if it isn't going to be. So is it is is it is the, is it the Inspector General of the Department? Is, is your recommendation that we stop the program? Uh, I would want to have more information from the department because we. How much more do you need when you look when you look at these numbers and how bad they are? How much more do you need to say this is just not working? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I I don't know. Uh, you know, I know there's 20,000 people in the in the in the mill at the at the end of June. Um, you know, whether these numbers are going to pick up, there is something we haven't seen, I can't say. Yeah, but I mean, at some point we say, how much longer do we but give the them? Numbers are, the placement numbers are, are, are very far behind. Yeah, very bad. And is there any, ever a chance they catch up to the targets they said they were going to hit? They, would ha they, could, they could catch up to their targets for serving. They would have to make a significant increase to catch up with their placement targets. Exactly. Mr. Freeman, real quickly, because I've got about 40 seconds here. The weatherization program. Um, you mentioned, I think, in your testimony, if I got it right, 9 of 17 uh, Homes you visit was this homes or commercial? Homes. Okay, so homes you visited did not pass inspection. That's correct. And how did how were these seventeen? Did you select them? Did did the Department of Energy tell you to? How were these these seventeen selected? They were not selected by the Department of Energy. We we don't work that way, Mr. Chairman. Okay, you just randomly picked them, or they were picked with in conjunction with the uh, the states in some cases. This is one example. There are other examples in other jurisdictions of uh, rejection rates because of uh, inadequate uh, work and poor quality work. So, but but um, based on your sample, over half? That's correct. Over half the homes didn't meet the requirements? In that, in that jurisdiction, that's correct. So I'm going to ask you the same question I asked Mr. Lewis. Is this weatherization program, based on what you've seen out there, over half the homes not meeting the criteria that's outlined and, and, and meeting the, the, the standard, uh, is this a program we should end? Uh, Mr. Chairman, it, it's a, it, that is a long, requires an extensive answer, so let me give, give me a minute or two if you don't mind. This program has been in effect since the mid-1970s. The funding on an annualized basis for the last several years has been about $400 million a year. It seems to me it doesn't matter how long it has been in existence. If it is bad, it is bad, and, and you know, well, well, they should have ended a long time ago. Maybe that is maybe that's a, a reason that, but that shouldn't pro prohibit us from doing the right thing and ending if it is that bad. Absolutely, and I am not suggesting that is the case. What I am suggesting is the fact that the program has a long history. It is a mixed bag. You're, I wouldn't say it is a total failure. There have been some successes, a number of successes. There are Department reports that over 500,000 homes have been weatherized around the nation. So there have been some successes. Uh, there have been some failures. I think the, uh, I would suggest that we fix it, not necessarily uh, end it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Not a total failure, just a failure in a lot of ways. Uh, with, with that, I will yield to my, my friend from uh, Ohio, gentleman, uh, Mr. Kucinich. Mr. Freeman, you're not recommending, though, that 
the United States government suspend all weatherization programs. Is that correct? That is correct. And uh, this recent audit was 9 of 17 weatherized homes visited that were visited failed inspections because of substandard workmanship. You are not concluding based on that that all weatherization uh, programs don't work. Is that right? That is correct. But, but, but Mr. Kucinich, let me put this in some perspective. We visited 10 or 20 states around the nation. And this was reflective of one particular jurisdiction and one particular community action, the work of one particular community action organization. There were problems in a number of jurisdictions that need to be corrected if the program is going to be continued. The purpose of what, what we were trying to achieve is a sort of a lessons learned. Here is what has gone wrong. Here is what needs to be corrected if the political judgment is to continue this program going forward. Well, let us look at this. I mean, who, who uses uh, weatherization? Uh, programs, and primarily lower income people. So are, are we, you know, we don't want to be in a position as a subcommittee in recommending that lower income people don't get help that they need. We, we want to do everything we can to lower their energy costs. So I, I think that we, this, this subcommittee has to be very, very careful about drawing any sweeping conclusions about uh, failures that may exist in some areas. And I will certainly yield to my friend. Well, I, I think the gentleman makes a good point, but we certainly don't want to, um, whether it is a green jobs training program or a weatherization program, have a program that doesn't work, that I, on one hand gives people false hope, on the other hand doesn't give them the, the standard that they are required, to, that they are entitled to get if we are going to have the program. You and I are 100 percent in concurrence on saying that if Federal dollars are being spent, we expect the workmanship to be good. I mean, it is one of the reasons why I support uh, uh, Davis-Bacon requirements. It is a workmanship issue. And so I, I, I think that uh, you know, we are on the threshold of, a, of another winter. Uh, it snowed here last weekend. Temperatures are dropping. Uh, there is poor people shivering in their homes. We don't want to tell them that they they are not going to have access to a weatherization program. I just want to be very careful about that. On, on the issue of workmanship, though, 100 percent in agreement with you. And, and we can give Mr. Friedman's help in how we tighten that up. Now, Mr. Katz, the time that I have remaining, you know, there is an assertion being made here um, that somehow this green energy and the potential for profit in it is some kind of a myth. You, you're, an, you're an investor in this, right? Isn't this your background? Yes, that's correct. I, I mean, can, can investors make money investing in green energy or not? Yes, they can. And uh, this do is, they? Uh, yes, they do. There have been an increasing number of uh, of IPOs and sales to large corporates from firms that we've invested in. I'm on the board of Tendril, for example, which is a smart grid company that's benefited from ARA funding. Beginning of last year, they were in 100,000 homes. End of this year, it will be 4.2 million homes. We expect to get a 10x return on that. Some companies we have invested what do you, you in. You want to explain so that well. uh, for the uninitiated, a 10x return? So, so investments are made in the hope that we are going to make money. That doesn't always happen. Uh, part of the portfolio is expected to not perform well, and others are expected to perform well. In the case of clean energy, we are seeing more and more companies that are performing well over time. And as they get purchased or as they go public, uh, the investors are returned money, and uh, the expectation is that the money that they receive back exceeds the money they put in. Let me ask you this. The Department of Defense is spending a lot of money on, on green energy research, is it not? Yes. Why? They believe it reduces the cost for delivering support services in the field. They believe it reduces uh, adverse security concerns. They believe it strengthens the military. They believe that clean energy is a more cost-effective way of delivering uh, their obligation. And have you, have you worked with people in the Department of Defense on any of these energy issues? Yes, I have. They are very excited about it. Uh, they think that it uh, strengthens security in a lot of different ways and on a cost-effectiveness basis uh, is a smart investment strategy. And I, I think it would be interesting for us to uh, have a hearing just with the Department of Defense on this issue, because what we are seeing is that those people who are inevitably charged to intervene on energy-related issues, with the geopolitics being what they are, 
are themselves cognizant of the imperative of moving towards green energy. And if the largest part of our, if, if, the, if the institution that drives one of the largest parts of the Federal Government is showing an interest in green energy, I think that not only should this committee pay attention to that, but I also think that uh, Wall Street ought to be paying attention to that as well. Thank you, Mr. Katz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. I just I want one follow-up question, if I could, with Mr. Friedman. The, the, the half the homes that you looked at that did not meet the standard, do you know who did the work? Was it a union contractor or non-union contractor? Do you know? Well, Davis-Bacon, I, I, I don't know in those particular instances. Davis-Bacon, for the first time, uh, in its 35 or 40 year history was introduced to the weatherization program as a result of the operation of the Recovery Act. So it is likely that we were talking about uh, union contractors doing this work? I, I, I don't know. I, I can't answer that question. Mr. Well, but, 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 but what you are saying is this is Davis Bacon I'm is being applied now, right, with the stimulus. It is a requirement now, correct? I apologize. Let me hear. I, I missed your statement. Go ahead, please. Davis Bacon is now required. Correct. You've, you're charged with looking at stimulus dollars out the door. Correct. Your testimony was half the uh, work done was not to standard, 9 out of 17. Correct. And so is it likely to conclude who did the work? I, I can't make that conclusion because it could have been people who were non-union who were being paid Davis-Bacon wages. Okay. Uh, would, would my friend yield? I'd be happy to yield. Since we are both uh, from Ohio, I will bet you a bag of Buckeyes that, that there weren't union contractors. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dr. Desjardins, the gentleman from Tennessee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I guess just to kind of bring things back in focus, we are here today as a subcommittee of oversight and reform to uh, take a look at stimulus oversight in this case. And, and uh, the, the hearing, of course, is entitled the green energy debacle, where has all the taxpayer money gone? And uh, you know, that is really why we are here. We are all here to make sure that all the good taxpayers are getting the best for their tax dollars. And I think clearly uh, the stimulus program has not uh, lived up to its expectations. So, uh, Mr. Friedman, just to kind of maybe try to put a cap on the weatherization issue, we have been beating that horse here for a while. Uh, I, I think about $5 billion of the stimulus money was set aside for weatherization projects for uh, paid contractors and nonprofit groups to make um, the homes of low-income Americans more energy efficient. Uh, being from Tennessee, uh, I think that there, uh, the program has revealed countless instances of waste, fraud and abuse. And in an audit in Tennessee, the Inspector General found that 246 energy measures installed in 41 homes revealed only a third were shown to meet department-directed minimum uh, energy savings to investment ratios. So your office has done investigations of stimulus-funded weatherization projects in, in many different states. Uh, Tennessee may be one, but what are some of the most egregious examples of the waste your office has uncovered? Well, um First, uh, mischarging, that is, charging for work that was never accomplished. Mm -hmm. uh, these are the, some of the schemes that we are currently investigating and have investigated. Secondly, uh, paying premiums for products that could be purchased at lower cost. Third is charging for work that was never done in general. Fourth is uh, uh, abusing the priority sequence of those who uh, could or should be receiving, who are eligible to receive the weatherization work, and those are four or five of the most significant uh, findings. And, of course, the, the whole question of substandard, uh, the quality of work issue, in, in some cases it was actually life-threatening. Is it true that uh, weatherization funds can be used to purchase uh, brand new refrigerators or air conditioners? I, I don't want to give you an inaccurate answer. Uh, certainly, furnaces would be appropriate. I don't know about. Uh, I don't know about. Did you say refrigerators? Refrigerators, air conditioning. Now, there are there are programs that that will give premiums other than weatherization for purchasing appli new appliances that are energy efficient. I don't believe it was covered under the weatherization program. Okay. Well, I'm not sure that would be found anywhere in the Constitution that that would be a right, but uh, rumor has it that is the case. Um, how much weatherization money do you think we could recover at this point of the $5 billion? Uh, I, I would suspect that uh, there will be very little that is recoverable at this point. Okay. Um, 
And changing gears just a little bit, uh, I think there was an article in the, maybe the Washington Post this morning, but uh, were the state and local governments ready to receive the massive amount of money that were allocated to them from the Department of Energy as part of the stimulus? Uh, unfortunately, they were not, and that was a, an issue that I think was predictable, and, and we, in fact, did anticipate that that would be a problem. Okay. So you don't think it was very wise to send millions of dollars to local governments who were in the process of, of laying off workers uh, because of the recession, they couldn't handle this influx of money, they weren't ready, and that contributed to the waste? Well, it, not meaning to make a, a joke out of a very serious subject, it's, it's been equated to attaching a, a lawn hose to a fire hydrant. The, the, the infrastructure, both at the Federal, State, and local level, simply was not there to, to accept the, the burden. Okay. So you think that that was a, a great contributor to the inefficiencies and the waste that the offices have seen? Certainly. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Montgomery, uh, you stated in your testimony that the mission of the Department of Energy and the purpose of the Recovery Act were not consistent. Could you please uh, expand upon this point for us? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes. The, the requirements of an effective energy technology development program um, are essentially stable, long-term funding. Uh, it also requires a careful selection process, especially if the money is being put in at the R&D stage. And that involves proposals, it involves peer review, it involves the formation of a program in which the, uh, the R&D stage is fit. Um, none of that fits with the classic prescription for stimulus, which is get the money in fast and turn it off quickly when it's no longer needed. That's exactly the opposite of what the Department of Energy needs. And it's the way we have killed any number of useful programs in the past. For example, the solar energy uh, initiative that I remember back in the uh, 1970s and early 1980s um, was cut off just as it was beginning to get going somewhere and um, in terms of uh, you know, production and bringing costs down. Well, based on your decades of experience in energy policy, does the entire concept of promoting green jobs make economic sense? Not through programs like the Recovery Act. I would say that green jobs are a solution in search of a problem. It is not a way of dealing with climate change. It is not a way of dealing with the government's responsibilities for R&D. It is not a way of dealing with the other environmental issues uh, that we face. Um, and it is certainly not a necessity for getting the U.S. economy to grow. It is something that may or may not happen if we put policies in place for those other objectives, but it is not a, a program that uh, has policy significance of itself. Okay. And I am out of time. Thank you, gentlemen. I thank the gentleman from Tennessee. We will now recognize the Vice Chairman, and then uh, followed by Mr. Kelly and Mr. Labrador. Oh, I'm excuse me. Mr. Kelly is up first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Montgomery, let's start, Doctor. Let's stay with you. I, uh, I know in the opening statements we talked about one of the, the problems with our dependency on oil is that there is also a military investment made. If we were to do it domestically, if we had a really aggressive domestic energy policy where we actually used our own resources, we know that there is a third of the world's coal is underneath our, service, our, our surface. We know that in Western Pennsylvania it is now being called the Saudi Arabia of natural gas. Uh, we have oil onshore, oil offshore. We have done an awful lot to hinder that development. And certainly, uh, I listened to John Hoffmeister early in the spring. He said there's 2 million jobs, a minimum of 2 million jobs waiting right now in the energy sector if we were to have an energy policy, a strategy that was aggressive. And, and I'm, I'm listening to what you're saying. So the cost of military, that's true. We do spend a lot of money in the military. But we wouldn't have to do it if we produced in our own country. And we wouldn't be spending petrodollars in countries whose ultimate goal is to annihilate us, and we're funding that process. I, I have a difficult time when I, when I hear that, you know, we want jobs, we want jobs right now, but we keep gaming ourselves, you know, and, and this investment that we have made, and only in government, by the way, I come from the private sector, and, and I love this idea of these green jobs and you have to go after them. When you don't have to worry about a, pro a positive return on investment, you can waste a lot of taxpayer money. There's hardworking Americans whose money has been invested, and I keep hearing this, though there's an element of risk. And I understand there is an element of risk, but when you take hard-earned American tax dollars and you throw it at an agenda rather than at a, at a strategy, and you see the waste, I mean, it must really rankle somebody like you who have done your whole life you have watched this happen, 
And it's just only in this town, only in this town can you squander money and not worry about it because there's an endless supply of it. And if, if you don't have enough money for that project, don't worry. We'll get more money. We'll just, we'll just raise taxes and we'll throw some more money at that and we'll reallot money to you. And I, I, I think that's really where we're at today. When we ask about this money has been wasted, there's nobody in the private sector that would continue to squander the capital that we're squandering right now on a reelection agenda and not on an energy policy that makes sense for America. And in all your work, would it be possible without government subsidies for these green jobs to go forward? Because you know what, I'll tell you what, in my district, and one of the local business owners, he has a marquee out in front of his place, he puts down green jobs equal red ink. And I, I'll tell you what, I think that guy has a better feel for what's going on with our policies right now than a lot of folks inside this beltway. So, I mean, really, without the subsidies, I mean, we talk about, well, yeah, General Motors is willing to invest in the Volt. No kidding. They got a safety net underneath them. I mean, market driven means you can drive it off the lot. Somebody wants to buy it. Not you're going to throw somebody $7,500 of taxpayer money, federal money, and then $3,500 of, of Pennsylvania money for somebody to drive that car off the lot. And we're already seeing, by the way, and I know this because I'm a Chevy dealer, this great idea that we're going we're to produce 16,000 of these volts this year. Well, we're selling about 500 a month. If you do the math, there's 10,000 volts that are going to have no home to go to. I, and being a dealer, I know whose driveway they end up in or whose lot they end up in. Just tell me, without the government subsidies, who would venture into this wonderland, and I mean wonderland, uh, wondering if it could possibly work, if it was their own money? Uh, thank you, Mr. Kelly. I think I heard three questions. So let me go back to the first one, which was More about, frustration than questions, I've got to tell you. About, thank you. No, I think there were. Well, there were three topics I would, uh, I would like to talk about. The first one is energy security. Most of, what we're here, most of the green jobs that we are hearing about now are either in the weatherization area, which we have heard talked about, um, classifying construction, you know, certain construction jobs as green, um, or they have to do, do with generating electricity, because in the short term, the technologies that we are deploying are largely electricity-related technologies. Um, and the electricity technologies are already being supported by things like the state-level renewable portfolio standards. Um, and requirements of the various public, you know, California's requirements for renewable energy. Um, and that is making a market. Again, it is created by a, a government, but it is created by regulation. The opportunities in the near term for actually changing our oil imports are very, very limited on the green technology side, because Biofuels are going to be a long time to develop. They require serious breakthroughs in order to accomplish uh, something. Um, electric vehicles, I think you have described very accurately that the market just, not, just does not exist for electric vehicles with the current prices of electricity and the current prices of these vehicles, except for people to whom they are a very expensive toy or people who will be given them for free. Um, so what are we going to do about energy security? Green Jobs Program is not affecting energy security, because if you, define en if you define energy security as either reducing the amount of world's oil supply that is produced by our enemies or reducing U.S. oil imports, their production is probably the most rapid way that we can do something about it. The transportation sector is going to be very hard to get off oil, and electricity doesn't consume oil. So putting money into electric technologies doesn't affect that, you know, uh, that uh, our oil balance at all. As far as government subsidies go, yes, I think that as if, if con once Congress makes the, made the decision that there was not going to be a price of carbon in the market, that there was not going to be a cap-and-trade program or a carbon tax, that means that, most of, that any technology that was depending on that, any technology that is going to produce renewable energy at a cost that is 25 percent higher than burning coal, is not going to have a market beyond what is created by the State Renewable Portfolio Standards, which gets into a third important issue, I think, and maybe this will provoke, maybe you will let us have some debate among the panelists, but it is that um, Mr. Katz mentioned that investors can make money on clean energy. Well, certainly they can if they are selling into, you know, wind turbines into a market where the RPS, the, the, the Renewable Portfolio Standard, says the utilities must buy wind, well, investors are going to make money selling wind. Actually, most of the wind is going to be you know, 
it is another trade issue about where the wind turbines are being purchased. But my question is, if, if a venture that was funded largely by private equity and made a 10 times return for its private equity investors when it was sold to a big company, why did it need Recovery Act funding? It seems to me that we are in a situation where if you, if you, if you can make a profit on doing something through private equity, you don't need the Recovery Act funding. And if there is not a market for the product, the Recovery Act funding is not going to be enough to create a sustained industry. Thank you, Doctor. We now recognize Vice Chairman Ms. Perkins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you to our panelists for being here this morning. Um, you know, many of us came here to Congress in uh, part of the 2010 elections because of the economy, because of jobs, because of the state of uh, what was going on in our country, and, and this notion that the government can spend money to create jobs. And the stimulus, uh, which was touted as never going to get unemployment above 8 percent, uh, we see that we have now got unemployment, and it has been there for 24-plus months uh, at 9 percent or hovering around 9 percent. So the uh, Keynesian economics didn't work. Now we are being pushed another stimulus. Well, we need this uh, an additional stimulus, because the first stimulus wasn't enough. Now we are going to have the second stimulus, and we are going to spend money. And when I am out in the district and I hear from uh, some of the supporters of this notion, they say, well, it creates jobs and we want to create jobs. And we all want to create jobs. We want to get this economy back on track. But the government can't do that. That is the private sector's job. The private sector can do it. So we, we look at the stimulus, and, and my question is for uh, Mr. Friedman. All of these jobs that were created, these green jobs, what happens when this money, when this money is spent? What happens to those jobs? Well, uh, Ms. Burkle, the, the Department's $35 billion plus its loan guarantee authority that came with the Recovery Act, there are a lot of different ways in which it was spent. But let me give you one example. As, we, as I reported in my, in my testimony, the, the Department used a substantial amount of money to advance its uh, environmental remediation program, remnants of the Manhattan Project at sites around the country. And the money has dried up. The money has come to an end. And 4, 000, between 4,000 and 5,000 people will be losing their jobs between now and the end of, end of December of, of this year. So uh, you have to look at each uh, bucket separate, somewhat separately. And certainly in the case of the money that was spent for creation of, of these jobs, uh, they, they come to an end, uh, and, uh, which is unfortunate for those individuals. And so the arguments that we hear, well, you know, let's spend this money to create jobs. These are short-term jobs, and we would be far better served to get a, a good, solid transportation bill in place, uh, which would have shovel-ready jobs eventually, and those jobs and the funding would be available rather than this temporary spending. Uh, Mr. Friedman, I, I just want to talk a little bit about um, 1705, a loan program. And um, my question is, and, and I realize you going to be looking into this, or you are looking into it, and you may not be able to comment on certain uh, portions of it. But when, when, and this kind of goes to what Mr. Kelly was talking about, this notion that when the government is funding something, it's a deep, it's a, a endless pit. You know, there's just more money to throw, and if it doesn't work, we'll just pour more, pour more money into it. Um, when, when a program like Solyndra when you identify that there is such a significant loss, is anything done to make a change midway through that program and saying, this isn't working and we need to restructure this program so it does work, so we are not throwing good money after bad and we are not wasting American taxpayers' money? Well, Ms. Burkle, I, I can talk about the audit work that we have done with regard to the Loan Guarantee Program. The most recent report was issued in March of this year in which we identified problems in uh, the way the Department documented, the, it, the way it addressed risks and uh, mitigated those risks, I, I can certainly talk about that. But in terms of the specific case that you are referring to, we have acknowledged, as has the FBI and the Department of Justice, that we have an ongoing criminal investigation, and, and I, I can't comment beyond that. And lastly, I have a few uh, seconds left here. Is, uh, aside from Slender, is your office concerned that there will be other losses uh, with programs where we have given money to them and that uh, the government 
uh, aka the American taxpayers, will, will also sustain losses? Well, I, I at this point, um, I, I'm not in a position to. I, uh, I have not evaluated every loan guarantee in the portfolio, uh, so I'm not in a position to uh, to project or to anticipate uh, what may occur or may not occur. So I'm, I can't give you a really thorough answer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank the gentlelady. Now recognize the gentleman from uh, Baltimore, uh, ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Cummings, and then Mr. Lavender. Uh, Mr. Friedman, the. Um and one of the things you said that was very interesting was that the um, that part of the problem was that um, when these funds went to the states, that in some instances the uh, employees who were responsible for dealing with these uh, had furloughs. Furloughs were an issue, sir. Yes. Oh, okay. And was that did you find that the case in, in, in many instances? There were several jurisdictions, states which, in which that was the case, Mr. Cummings. Uh, uh, and it was there is an irony there which is really unfortunate, which is that here we come to the states with a program that is designed in part to stimulate uh, the economy and to create jobs, and yet the very people who would, who would administer the program and, and apply the mechanics to the program and make it work were furloughed because of the state, the condition of the state economy. It's a, it's an unfortunate irony, if that's the right word for it. And the um, to to get these, I mean, it sounds like, and I think Mr. Lewis says something to this effect. Also, it seems as if there was an effort to get the programs up and running in a certain amount of time, and in an effort to do that. A lot of times, all the mechanisms weren't in place to effectively accomplish that. Is that would that be a fair statement, Mr. Lewis? Uh, certainly, uh, one of the premises of the Recovery Act was to get money out there quickly. Uh, and in the you, case the, of our programs, we did have a lot of new grantees who had not done labor programs mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. And um, DEO's uh, five hundred and thirty-five million dollar loan guarantee to Solyndra and its subsequent bankruptcy are, are well known. And on Monday, we learned that uh, Beacon Power Corporation, which received $43 million in stimulus funds through the loan guarantee program, filed for bankruptcy on October 30th. Now, Mr. Freeman, isn't it true that DEO's loan program's office was specifically designed to provide funding to companies that, because of the type of company, find it difficult to obtain uh, funding from the private sector? Is that an accurate statement? I, I, uh, earlier, I think before you returned to the, to the room, I, I indicated I can't, because of a, a criminal investigation, discuss uh, particular I'm firms. sorry. But in terms of the generic question, you are abso absolutely correct. That was the reason for the program, and uh, that was the reason that the office was, uh, was created as well. And isn't it true that these companies are generally pursuing, and I think this, this would, would, it would be in your purview, uh, pursuing um, cutting edge technology from battery production to solar to even nuclear power? Is that an accurate statement? Uh, I believe that is accurate, yes. Isn't it true that the list of companies funded through DO's office involves almost 50 companies who have uh, operations throughout the United States, and therefore, when we see some failures, wouldn't, it, wouldn't that be expected, given the high-risk nature of what they do? Well, I am a little reluctant to get into the question of, of, of risk and, uh, and outcomes, sure. but, but obviously there is a risk. Otherwise, these firms would not need government, uh, a government loan guarantee. And when you look back on um, uh, what you found? What 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 were your recommendations? Well, we recommended with regard to the March, the, the third of our reports was which was March of 2011. We recommended that the department develop a much more robust system for documenting how it evaluates the risks uh, with each individual applicant and how those risks are mitigated. Now, did this money come come under Devaney, Mr. Devaney? I'm sorry? Did this money come under Mr. Devaney's 
Well, watch. I, I am a member of the, of the Recovery Act uh, Accountability and Transparency Board. So uh, I guess arguably all the Recovery Act money uh, was within the purview of the Board and Mr. Devaney. Uh, so the answer, I, guess, I suppose, is yes, but this, this is a Department of Energy program. I, I got you. Outside of uh, the rat. Well, let me, let me tell you why I asked that. One of the things that he said is that he was trying to put in mechanisms by which he would prevent these things from happening. And I was just wondering, um, were there prevention efforts here? And if so, why do we have so many problems with that? Uh, is that directed? Yes. Uh, certainly, there was, a, there was a system of, of a due diligence that was uh, exercised by the Department. Uh, was it adequate? You know, that remains to be, to be seen. And the due diligence effort, at least presumably, would have been to identify the risks, to determine what mitigating circumstances or what mitigating uh, factors or controls can be put in place, uh, was the risk, were the risks tolerable, uh, and how you proceed from, from there. So, yes, there was a due diligence process in place. The adequacy, I'm not sure I can comment on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I now recognize Mr. Labrador. Chairman, I will yield my time to you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. McMahon, and I, I really, uh, these hearings are, are of great value, I think, to the American people because it is the only time they really get to see how their money is being spent. Uh, I look at this as more of a stewardship than anything else. I know it is an elected office, but really we are stewards of American taxpayer money, mm -hmm. and we have to be responsible for them for the way this money is being spent. So I have been here nine months, but I come from the private sector, as you do. Uh, can you discuss a little bit these, these green jobs? I, we, we found out in a prior hearing that uh, a bus driver who is driving a diesel bus, when he switches over to an alternative energy bus, now becomes a, he's, we created a green job. Uh, so uh, the fact that the American public gets gamed so many times uh, with these marketing efforts to take whatever it is that we are trying to achieve, and I'm, I'm, I really uh, I am at a struggle sometimes to go back home and tell people in Northwest Pennsylvania we are spending your money the right way. They say, really? Uh, we don't see it that way. So tell me, again, some of the green jobs that you see in your construction business. Sure. They're, they're actually, it's, uh, it's quite fascinating because they are actually all the same jobs that currently exist. The, the goal here is to just create a new label. Uh, it, it is um, um, uh, it's just a misnomer to think that somebody who works, uh, who cuts wood from a sustainable forest has any skill that is any different from somebody who cuts wood that doesn't come from one. But if you were to ask the Department of Labor, uh, this current Department of Labor, that is a new skill set somehow. It literally is, uh, and we had carpenters for a long time. Um, uh, we have had uh, sheet metal workers reinforcing uh, steel people that maybe they uh, turn bolts to erect a wind turbine, but it is no different than building a uh, coal-fired uh, 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 furnace uh, a couple of years ago. I mean, literally, and you will have people, you know, we have done, uh, LEED standards were started in the early 1990s, here in D.C., actually. I actually uh, worked for a guy who uh, helped write them originally um, back in the early 90s. And um, uh, we have done uh, probably north of 100 uh, LEED certified buildings, uh, several hundred million square feet, just as a company ourselves. Um, but there is no skill set difference between these two people. Uh, the idea here, really, what they were trying to do in the district um, was really quite uh, nefarious, and it is nice that they just kind of laid it all out here. They are trying to take a zoning law, the D.C. Green Building Act and claim that, that somehow there was a new skill set required to actually work on things covered that were considered green, um, and therefore create uh, this, this uh, place where they create a new apprenticeship standard. Now, I mean, I know that we uh, as a company and every other merit shop contractor in the district uh, area, we would all have had our, uh, you know, literally decades of apprenticeship standards uh, trying to get them passed. We would have them tossed, and therefore we would be barred. Uh, and this wasn't the only uh, jurisdiction that that was attempted. Um, Texas, uh, uh, Northern Virginia, a number of other places where they attempt to use a, a zoning bill, claim that somehow the skill set required a new apprenticeship standard, and then people would have to recertify their program. If I could just quickly answer one quick question I heard uh, the, uh, the ranking member discussing about Davis-Bacon wages. 
Back in Title X uh, of the Energy Act that passed in the end of 2007, there was something included called the Clinton-Sanders Amendment. It altered the Workforce Investment Act for the first time you were required to actually have a union as a partner in order to qualify for any training grant funds. Uh, furthermore, the union would, in, in a particular jurisdiction or covered by a particular trade, would have uh, effectively veto power over any uh, grant money that was expended. So uh, it is in the law that uh, they altered the Workforce Investment Act, which up till now, up to this point, had never considered union or nonunion affiliation as far as grant funding. This actually requires that you have a union as a partner in order to qualify for the grant funding under the Green Jobs Act that the Inspector General is uh, telling us about. Well, thank you. I, and, I, and I do think, again, this is a forum for people like you coming out of the private sector getting a chance to actually speak to the American people. Mm -hmm. Mr. Lewis, Department of Labor, tell me some of these jobs that we were training people for, the skills that we were, were training them in. Well, some of them are very, uh, very technical. Uh, they are very technical uh, skills related to the to the green energy industry. But some are, as you've heard this morning, they're they're jobs that can be just as easily applied to to other industries. Uh, so we could be teaching people to weld uh, for a, a green manufacturing uh, entity, uh, but they could use that skill set elsewhere. Our real concern in the results of this job at this point, and it is still interim, is that we, you know, whether you call it a green job or not, we simply don't see the people getting a job, any job. Uh, the, the, the rate of placement to what they had intended for this program and compared to our other programs is, is significantly lower. No, and I don't doubt, for one cent, uh, second, the, the intention, and, and I think government does this a lot, that the intentions are always great. It's just that I've seen much better results coming out of the private sector when it's your own skin in the game and you have to measure twice and cut once. You know you have that dollar to spend one time, and that's your dollar. And there's no backup. There's no safety net. So once it's gone, it's gone. And I think that's the whole purpose of the hearing today. Every penny we're talking about comes out of the, of the American taxpayer's pocket. And not only do they deserve a positive return on that, they should expect that from us. And when we get to a point that we can no longer objectively describe where their money went and if we have to relabel it or game it in order to make a failure look like it worked, I mean, I would say, Mr. McMahon, you and I have made many decisions in our life, and we go before the people that we represent and we say, look, you know, I made a mistake. I got to tell you, this isn't working. But we also don't have the benefit of unlimited sources of revenue and capital that we don't have to collateralize. And I think that's the danger of these programs. Well intentioned or not, we end up in a situation where we continue to throw good money after bad because we can't stand and tell people, you know what, it was a bad policy. It was a bad program. And we need to backtrack now. We have money that's been appropriated but not yet spent. There's got to be a way to pull that money back and put it somewhere where it's actually going to have a positive effect. I, I, I can't tell you, I, I really appreciate all of you being here today. Uh, I know it's tough to take time out of your personal lives and come here, it's, but it's important for the American people to understand that we do have an accountability that we must face with them. And if it's truly only going to be about reelection, then we shouldn't run again. It has to be about actually reforming what it is that we're doing. And if we're not doing it the right way, stand up and say, we made a mistake. And we're going to change it. So again, thank you so much for being here. And at that point, I think the hearing is adjourned. Thank you. Sorry, we didn't get a chance to debate. It's always yeah. frustrating sitting here.